Everybody ready? Yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, uh, before I start, I just wanted to say uh, thanks for inviting me to talk. Um, it's quite nice because we've been in a museum bubble here in, the, um, here in the collections for a little while. It's nice to connect with people in the wider world once more and kind of see what everybody else has been getting up to. Um, so my name's Louis Lofthaus, and I'm one of the collections assistants on the Hope for the Future project here at um, Oxford University Museum of Natural History, which is a project tasked with rehousing um, one million uh, British insect specimens. Um, so our entire British collection. Um, so I'll focus mainly on collections work as that is the portion of the project that I'm mostly involved in, but I will have some information on the other aspects of the project for anybody who's interested in the end. Um, so um, when thinking when to, where to start, I thought we'd, I'd take you on a, a quick journey back through time um, to have a look at how some of our collections were formed. Um, so we'll go back to the, uh, the early 1800s to mid 1800s and look at two people um, Ellen Hope and Reverend Frederick Hope, um, who are the inspirations for the naming of the project as well, the Hope Project. Um, so they're both passionate naturalists and avid collectors who um, amassed collections of uh, vertebrate specimens, geological specimens, um, but most fortunately for us, they had a great passion for collecting and studying insects as well. Um, so they collected locally at locations like um, Shotover and Tubney Wood and even further afield um, abroad in Italy um, and other places. Um, and so their deed of gift in 1849 came to the museum and formed the nucleus um, of the entomological collections at the museum. Um, so with the with more collections being donated over time um so where was i um yeah so so the result is that we've got a a collection of um, british insects that spans almost um the entire period of um british entomological history um so some of you may be familiar as well we have the oldest pinned insect specimen in the world um from 1702 bath white butterfly um, so there's a real heritage here at the museum and um, a lot of things that are worth preserving um, going forward into the future. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, so currently the uh, museum's collections house approximately 6 million specimens or so. Um, and 5 million of those are insect specimens. And of those 5 million, we have the 1 million British insect specimens that this project is primarily concerned with. Um, and these are a, a wonderful source of um, inspiration and a great resource for researchers to use, um, looking into all sorts of different um, avenues of research, ranging from things like calligraphy with labels and history, um, all the way through to biomimetics and um, engineering. Um, biological recording and conservation as well. Um, so there's real broad use for the collections. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so thanks to funding from the National Heritage Lottery Fund, the Hope for the Future project was able to start on the 1st of November, 2019. Um, and so we have a picture here of the Westwood Room as it originally was um full of cabinets um so we had over 150 cabinets in there um filled with drawers which were in turn filled with insects um some of them containing uh thousands of insects some only containing one or two um so it's a bit of a lottery going in there you never quite know what you'll find um the project also has an outreach um, element as well. We were quite fortunate to have three outreach of, uh, education officers um, who will go out to visit the community, visit schools as well, and try and um, encourage 
an appreciation of the importance of collections, um, biological recording, and the study of invertebrates in general. Um, and so after, after the project's done as well, this Westwood Room space will be restored um, to its original uh, pre-Raphaelite design. Um, so it'll be one of the only three uh, rooms in the building that have the original design from the building's construction and will house a teaching space um, with microscopes um, and be available as a public engagement space as well. And in the Whiteham room, which is just through the doors at the end there, um, we'll have a an Ellen Hope gallery um, focusing on issues surrounding invertebrate biodiversity and conservation. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, on the face of it, there's, the project's quite a mind-boggling task because um, you've just got a room kind of crammed full of a million insects and you're not quite sure where exactly to start. How do you even um, get going on a project of that magnitude? Um, and the answer is kind of step by step. Uh, so here we've got a picture of just one of our many draw deliveries. Um, so this is only 400 and the project was expected to receive about 4,000 or so. Um, along with the unit trays, which will be housing the actual insect specimens inside the drawers, of which there are roughly 40,000 as well. So just taking delivery of those and moving them from A to B is a task in and of itself. Um, but then also all of the British insect specimens in the drawers were photographed in their current storage um, situation um, for posterity. So say, for example, if we needed to go back through and have a look at how a historic collection was arranged um, before we'd moved it, say we had trouble locating um, a certain specimen, we could go back and look at how they've been arranged in the past and um, we don't miss out on any of that information that may have been in the drawers. Um, so overall, to photograph the collections alone that uh, has taken us weeks um, so far. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, and um, so then once once everything's kind of in place um, and we're able to go back and look at uh, what the collections used to look like, we can get on with the moving of the specimens. So believe it or not, uh, besides a few exceptions, uh, every single specimen on the project um, receives its own label. Uh, denoting the original position it held in the collections and also attributing them to our museum. So say if we sent some out on loan, um, we know that they will be a lot easier to um, reassociate with our museum uh, when it comes time to return specimens. Um, so in theory, everything is reversible um, if needed and everything is now associated with the museum. Uh, so we've got here on the left is uh, Amaret Spooner, who many of you may be familiar with if you've come in to use the collections in the museum, um, who is the team leader on the project. And we have Ryan Mitchell moving the first unit tray of Coleoptera um, on the project as well. And he's one of my colleagues, a collections assistant on the project. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so these new drawers that we've received, um, there's a good reason for using new drawers such as those. Um, the top two pictures that we have here are of the current storage situation in the museum. And these are old drawers uh, lined with cork. Um, which amongst other issues can occasionally react with the pins um, and make it quite difficult to remove a specimen, um, make it easy to damage them on occasion um, if you really have to give it a good yank to get it out of the cork um, to examine it further. Um, also, this drawer at the top here doesn't have any, but in the linings of the drawers, um, there is naphthalene 
um, in pretty much all of the drawers in the collection, which accounts for the um, the smell. If anybody's been upstairs in the museum in the Whiten Room, you probably will have been able to smell it through the doors um, of the Westwood Room there. Uh, but that makes it a little tricky to use the collections as well if you're constantly exposing yourself to um, naphthalene while navigating the collections. Um, and it can even sublimate into the drawers. We had um, a snake fly that was completely encased in naphthalene. Um, which apparently will eventually dissipate, but um, can make it a bit tricky. And so the new drawers uh, here are airtight, so there's no need for any um, any chemicals or repellents, um, and they'll be housed in airtight cabinets as well. Um, and the insects are transferred into a unit tray system, um, which has a number of benefits, which I'll go into in the next slide. But... Um, it's quite handy for um, associating missing limbs and missing bits of specimens or labels with their original um, specimens uh, because everything's contained in that tray. Um, so the arranging part process um, is kind of like a large game of Tetris um, and something that's... Uh, some collection staff get quite excited about in the building um, but it's one of the one of the main reasons why the project will be so beneficial in the future because we will be able to using these unit trays this unit tray system very quickly um, arrange and rearrange large numbers of specimens um, without risking damaging them by picking them up individually um, so Everything will be arranged to modern checklists, um, which is great because it means everything, um, all of a certain species will all be in the same place now. So it will really kind of um, really make research and using the collections a lot easier, especially in the navigation of the collections. And we are also leaving room for expansion in the future as well. Um, so you'll be able to say if we have a missing species, we've left a gap and that can easily be incorporated in the future. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I chose this as, um, as quite an aesthetic um, example of some of the conservation work that we get to do as part of the project as we're working through. Um, so this is a kind of a bloom of verdigris that's emerged from a specimen here, clear wing moth. Um, and it's caused by a reaction between pins containing copper and the lipids in within the insect. And so it can actually be, although it is quite beautiful in a way, it can actually be quite damaging, um, sometimes splitting the specimens apart or um, dismembering them. And... Um, It can also affect the labels as well. It can make them quite hard to read um, by discolouring them or uh, smudging lettering with um, grease. Um, so it's fairly easily remedied. Um, you just take a paintbrush and you can gently brush it all away and um, maybe repin the insect um, if necessary. So um, next slide, please. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the beautiful artwork that's been created. Um, so the verdigris, it, it's not all bad in the museum. You can take s some positive from it in that it can be collected and then a pigment can be made, um, a paint can be made from the pigment. And Catherine Child, the imaging technician at the museum, has created beautiful um, artworks in the past um, using verdigris paint um, from insect specimens of insect specimens, if that makes any sense. Um, so it's really, it, it can kind of turn around to be quite a beautiful thing in the end. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the reasons that the new airtight storage is quite important is to keep pests out. Um, so 
a lot of you will be aware of the notorious um, Anthrenus carpet beetles um, that have dismayed generations of entomologists um, by devouring their, uh, their hard-won collections. Um, and here, fortunately, in the collections, we didn't have too many instances of pest damage um, because everything is regularly checked. But it does pay to be, um, to be diligent. So this is an example of the kind of damage that can um, come about if a drawer is unattended for a long period of time and and three beetles manage to infiltrate them. Um, it does set us up for a good uh, a good joke as you're moving specimens because of course uh, we do actually have carpet beetles as specimens in the collection so you can make the joke oh this drawer is completely full of um, anthrenus and watch the look of horror on Ammo's face um, and she's fallen for that one quite a few times now um, so next slide please um, so after all of this uh, this moving rearranging um, repairs um, removal of verdigris and whatnot um, the specimens are ready to be moved. Um, so they'll all be photographed once again um, to show them in their new storage, in their current arrangement. And at the moment, it is planned um, that all of this will be made available online, um, which is really great. Um, as it means members of the public will be able to browse um, the insect collections more or less at their leisure. Um, and so after that, um, which is quite a lengthy process in itself, they will all be moved off site to temporary storage. Um, so if anybody's been to the museum recently, uh, they'll notice the hoarding out on the lawn. And there's quite a lot of building work happening behind that hoarding on the Radcliffe Science Library basement area. And that is where eventually all of these collections will come back to. But until then, they are being moved to um, an off-site storage with some bespoke um, cabinets um, there to await their return um, to the museum. Um, everything will still be available, but it will take a little more time maybe to arrange um, certain specimens to be brought back. Um, so you can use the usual avenues to use the collections by contacting the collections managers. Um, and so all of these drawers here, uh, we have, these are all the collections assistants on the project. So from left to right, it's myself, uh, Stephen Williams, Ryan Mitchell, and Tom Greenway. And these drawers here are just a portion of our entire Lepidoptera collection, basically. So it gives you an idea of the scale of the move and just how many specimens we have, because it's quite hard to envisage what a million specimens looks like. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's uh, the new storage. Uh, it's myself putting the first um, drawer into, into the new cabinets, um, which will also be coming back into the Radcliffe Science Library, the basement area. Um, so overall, there'll be space for around 12,000 drawers and we've used about 4,000 or so for the collection including room for expansion and whatnot um, so it'll be a really good area um, a really safe area as well for housing all these collections hopefully for generations to come to use uh, next slide please um, so one of the joys of being on the project is um, encountering things that you wouldn't normally um, come across um, so you get all sorts of rare natural phenomena. Um, for example, this gynandromorphic common blue butterfly, um, which has the characteristics of both male and female. Um, so we've got the male on the right there, the female on the left, and the gyn gynandromorphic specimen in the middle, um, which is something that you wouldn't, you'd be quite lucky to see um, normally out in the wild. Um, and of course, you do come across some um, faux pas and some interesting um, mounting techniques as well. Like we've got a little uh, a kebab, kind of an insect kebab here. Um, when somebody's tried to, I suppose, save some time, uh, didn't want to write out all their labels. 
and um, pinned all of this, all of these insects to the same label. Um, so we've got, and you, you come across all sorts of interesting data labels. We had one um, from the area that is now the museum toilets. Um, you get some that are kind of, they look like a folded up newspaper and you unfurl them and it's almost like a novella or a small book on the uh, circumstances surrounding the insects capture. Um, so there are all sorts of wonderful kind of little things that you come across day to day. They're either amusing or um, expand your knowledge in some way. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so we do... the. Uh, along with the collections work we do as well, we do have an outreach aspect of the project. Um, so we've got some Move a Million events, which give people an opportunity to actually come in and do a bit of collections work. Um, of course, with some fairly robust specimens, um, just to make sure that um, even if your hands are a little shaky, it's still okay. Um, and we do have some volunteering opportunities um, as well to move some specimens, maybe restage um, certain things, label insects, and get a little bit of um, experience with collections as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so as I was saying earlier as well, we've got the, um, we were quite fortunate to be able to have three education officers, um, Roger, Kate, and Susie. Um, on the project and they've been doing some great work going out into the community and um, visiting schools, um, teaching people about the value of um, biological recording, identification um, and getting people involved with museum specimens and relaying the importance of insects to them. Um, and what's great is they've been able to work with demographics that potentially aren't focused as much with um, with outreach projects. Um, so we've got older members of the public as well. Um, we recently had a Silver Sunday um, event where there were some crafts and things for, and uh, poetry workshops and all sorts of things. Um, so it's worth looking at on the events list on the website um, if you wanted to get involved in that way as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I, I feel like I'd be a little remiss if I didn't address um, the pandemic and its effect on the project because a lot of people are quite interested on uh, uh, about hearing how um, institutions have fared um, throughout the turbulent period. Um, so this is a sculpture of the, um, the virus that causes COVID-19, which was made by Angela Palmer and housed in the museum for a little while. Um, so lockdowns were an obvious uh, kind of barrier because short of taking the collections home with you, you can't really do any work on them from home. Um, so besides typing a few labels here and there using the photographs that we'd taken, um, which isn't ideal, uh, we didn't have too much that we were able to do off site. Um, so we were actually in um, more or less whenever the restrictions allowed. Um, and sadly, it meant that we couldn't have volunteers in to contribute to the project. Um, we weren't able to benefit from the expertise of honorary associates who would come in and do a lot of identification work or help with um, the arrangement of specimens um, and the taxonomy and the issues surrounding that. And obviously, the outreach aspect of the project as well was then limited to digital meetings and online events. Um, but on the other hand, it wasn't all bad because our um, the draws that were being made for the project, um, they were able to work all the way through and they actually hit their deadlines before they thought they would. Um, so it's, a, it's quite nuanced and an interesting issue and there's some good and some bad. Um, but... Uh, it probably helped as well because it gave us a bit of a break. Um, so we, our wrists, um, there was a bit of mercy for our wrists moving all these specimens one after another, um, which was good. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the status of the project at the moment, 
Um, we've moved everything off site except for uh, half of Diptera and essentially uh, parasitic Hymenoptera as well. So this is what the Westwood room looks like today. Um, we only have the back wall, the bank of cabinets on the back wall and this island of cabinets here um, on the right, which is where the Diptera collection is housed. And um, so that means by December, which is when the end of the project ends, uh, hopefully the room will be completely empty and the work on restoring the Westwood room and creating the Ellen Hope Gallery uh, will be able to begin. Um, next slide, please. Um, and if you're ever in the museum as well, we have a small presenting case exhibition on the project, um, which can which means you can have a look at some of the wonderful specimens that we've got, some of the intriguing insects and um, conservation issues that we've faced over the course of the project. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I've put up some links here. Um, so we've got the Hope for the Future website. Um, the education officers are running a young entomologist blog as well. If you know anybody who'd be interested in that, some great articles on there. Um, there's an events list um, if you wanted to get involved in the project or um, come to events like the late night event this evening, which it explores um, invertebrates uh, as food, actually, as part of a wider um, Meet the Future linked um, event about the future of food. And um, I've included the NHLF's website as well, so you can see some of the great work that they do with other institutions and other organisations. And without them, we wouldn't have been able to do any of this um, important work. Um, so thank you very much.